Hello, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good night, whoever you, uh, wherever you are. Um, my name is Ricardo Leal. Uh, I was a professor of finance uh, at the Copiati Business School uh, in Rio, Brazil, but I, I have also taught in several dis different places, including uh, Georgetown University and the University of Nevada in the United States uh, as a, as a full-time faculty, as well as uh, in other uh, universities in Europe and South America as a visiting faculty. Uh, so always teaching finance and investments. And the idea here is to talk a little bit about the impact of the COVID pandemic on investing in emerging markets from the point of view of financial markets, okay? So uh, I will uh, start my presentation with uh, a poll. So going to the first poll question, uh, and uh, I'll ask David to, to open the first poll question, uh, do you live or have lived for a long time in an emerging market as an adult? So the poll is open and I ask you to answer so I have an idea uh, of what your, pop, uh, what your proportions are. So I think uh, uh, we are done. So close to uh, about 70% of you have uh, lived uh, in, in an emerging market as an adult, which is a very high proportion. Uh, so many of you would be familiar with some of the issues that I'm going to mention. So let's move on uh, to the next slide. Yeah, that one. So uh, obviously, as you should know quite well, uh, emerging markets are not <laughs> a homogeneous uh, classification at all. And as I illustrate in this slide for you, uh, you can see four different income uh, per capita categories uh, from the World Bank classification. And then you can see that there are markets uh, which are considered emerging or were recently considering emerging that are now at the high income branch uh, uh, bracket uh, of income for the World Bank, which is uh, above $12,600 a year uh, per capita. And you can see there some of the markets like Saudi Arabia and Chile uh, Croatia and some uh, other uh, countries. Uh, then you have the upper middle bracket uh, with markets between four and twelve thousand dollars a year per person. Uh, and you have some large emerging markets there, such as Argentina and Brazil and China, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, Turkey, and others which are mentioned there. Uh, then you have the lower income, middle income uh, bracket, uh, $1,000 to $4,000 per person per year. Uh, and you have a list of the markets there with countries with very large populations, as you can see there, Algeria, Angola, Bangladesh, and so on and so forth, Indonesia, India, uh, Nigeria, very important countries which are in this bracket. And then you have the low income countries, which are those that have per capita income of less than $1,000 per person per year. Uh, and you have a few of the, those countries listed as an example, okay? 
so uh, as you can see, these brackets are very different amongst themselves. Uh, uh, the, the difference uh, between the upper limit of the upper middle income bracket and then the uh, upper limit of the low income bracket is more than 12 times uh, of per capita income. So that's a big difference. And that uh, illustrates very clearly that emerging markets are not definitely uh, a homogeneous uh, classification and, and they uh, can hardly be lumped into one single uh, package. In regarding, uh, uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, regarding uh, the initial conditions uh, when the pandemic began last year, uh, this past year, uh, you have the issue of poverty. Every emerging market, and of course, many <laughs> wealthy countries as well, uh, have uh, a, a poverty issue. And naturally, many emerging markets, as you saw in those brackets, are made up of the vast majority of people being very poor. Uh, so uh, you would have le people living in precarious situations, uh, probably in dwellings with uh, uh, many people in it, multi-generation dwellings, sanitation could be very poor, uh, you know, the issue of uh, uh, water and sewage uh, could be non-existent in terms of a treatment and collection. Uh, you would have agglomeration everywhere, not only in the house, but everywhere, agglomeration on the streets, uh, public transportation would be very bad and very crowded. Uh, and, and healthcare could be very limited and the inf healthcare infrastructure uh, would be bad. So these initial conditions for the pandemic in emerging markets naturally are, are, are very bad. Uh, the issue of structure as well. What I mean by that is there is no home office for many or most people in emerging markets. These people work uh, in uh, many times uh, in informality. Uh, they are self-employed. Uh, they try to fend for themselves uh, uh, somehow. Many work in the services uh, industry. You know, they are barber or hairdresser or someone selling fruit on the street, uh, something like that. So uh, uh, these people, there's no absolutely no opportunity for isolating themselves and working out of the house through an IT uh, infrastructure. Uh, they don't do that. They don't have the means and that's not their work. Uh, it's impossible. And naturally they have to go out to work and they have to face public transportation, agglomeration, and so on. And besides, public transportation could be, the infrastructure could be bad. People would have to agglomerate in trains, uh, precarious buses, and so on, uh, which only uh, favors the transmission of a viral disease like COVID. Um, then there is the issue of a very young population. Uh, so what I call the hormones, the young in particular, they will seek each other. Uh, uh, and that's, that's only natural. Uh, and they are the majority in, in emerging markets. They are not, uh, these countries are not countries in which uh, people, say 50% of the population would live by, by themselves alone. Uh, and would could be easily isolated or at least minimize social contact for for them in emerging markets. This is virtually impossible. Uh, so when you tell them to isolate, uh, it's sometimes could mean a bad joke because where exactly will they isolate? How? Uh, so, uh, so the and then the young will naturally seek each other, and then there's also the issue of poor educational systems, uh, and poor understanding of science, yeah. poor understanding of guidelines uh, regarding the disease, 
uh, maybe traditions which might be contradictory to those uh, recommend the, those the, the scientific recommendations, uh, and then also populist leaderships, which are not only <laughs> a, a thing that affects uh, emerging markets, but they they're uh, any any damaging effects from populist leadership may be more severe in emerging markets. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, so now it's just a quick picture. Uh, I'll present some quick pictures of the situation of COVID in some selected emerging markets, as well as a few developed markets, just for a comparison. Uh, the first slide is about underreporting. Many people say underreporting is a very serious problem, which it is, uh, but you can see again, the situation is not homogeneous across emerging markets. Uh, the US is on the top as a parameter for comparison. Uh, and you can see that, for instance, uh, Mexico and India have underreporting estimated at more than 60%, while Brazil underreporting is estimated to be even lower than that of the United States. And then you have some severe situations of possible underreporting in important countries like Russia, Egypt, uh, which are above 80% of estimated underreporting. The idea is that uh, they, they uh, estimate the excess deaths, and, and that's just you know taking historical number of deaths uh, 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 on a given time period, and then uh, what happened in 2020 and 21, uh, you know, the excess number of deaths relative to the historical, that's a rough estimate uh, of that these excess deaths were due to the pandemic. And then you compare to the official um, uh, death uh, figure. And then uh, if the, so you could see that you could have an estimate of the underreporting. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Now, here again, you have the, <clears throat> a similar issue. Official deaths per 100,000 people. So we normalize uh, uh, the numbers according to the size of the population of the different countries. So this is the official. And you can see uh, Brazil is uh, right at the top uh, with 276 deaths per 100,000 people. And, and, and then we move down, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, three Latin American countries leading this uh, official uh, ranking. And then you have a, a, a group of developed countries, UK, US, Spain, and France, UK being 200, showing uh, the worst situation in this chart. I selected only the bigger countries. Uh, there are uh, other countries in this ranking which are smaller, so I le left them out. Uh, and then you can see other developing countries such as South Africa, Iran, Russia, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Turkey uh, coming down there. But that's the official. If you move to the next slide, you can see the excess death situation. And then a very different graph emerges. Now uh, you have Azerbaijan uh, uh, being uh, the leading country with the number of excess deaths per 100,000 people. And a bunch of other countries that were not in the previous graph, uh, such as Bosnia, Bulgaria, and Albania, Mexico was in both. Uh, and then you have a, a few other countries that were not in the previous chart, like Macedonia, Belarus, Romania, and then Kazakhstan was in the other chart, Peru, uh, Slovakia, and then at the end, Russia, which was in both charts. So you see the situation changes very, um, uh, very much uh, uh, between the previous chart and this one because of the issue of underreporting. And why is there underreporting? It could be a number of reasons. Uh, it could be because the information infrastructure uh, in the healthcare uh, services is not good. It could be because there's not <clears throat> enough testing, so people die and you don't know uh, the causes of death. It could be because many people die at home or in the farm. 
uh, and the records are not good. And it could also be because governments are not promoting uh, good quality reporting for a variety of reasons, even political. So uh, it could be a number of uh, reasons that could explain why there is so much on the reporting in some countries. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and here you have a situation about regarding vaccination. Uh, and you can see that there are a couple of uh, South American countries leading in terms of the percent of population fully vaccinated, uh, Uruguay and Chile. And then you have Canada, UK and China, Germany, US, not, not a surprise. And then you have Malaysia showing uh, well as well. And then uh, after Japan, Argentina, Brazil and Mexico with uh, uh, around 30%, uh, Brazil is, is getting closer to, <clears throat> to 40% as it moves uh, quicker. And then Russia closes this chart with 26%. So what is a concern is that the world average at the time of this chart, uh, the numbers in this chart were produced was 28%. And you can see that uh, Mexico was right at the world average. Uh, Russia was a little below. And then you have a bunch, many uh, important emerging markets which are way below average. So uh, this uh, world average is skewed towards the large population countries such as the US, China, uh, that managed to vaccinate a large proportion of their populations uh, quickly, while there are countries in Africa in which the proportion of people fully vaccinated uh, doesn't even get to 5%. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity, once again, regarding uh, the vaccination in emerging markets. And, and uh, many scientists have been affirming that uh, this is far from over uh, just because uh, the way the, 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 the disease developed around the world and the way it was treated uh, it naturally was quite uh, different and unequal. Uh, with the wealthier countries, even the, if we consider the wealthier emerging markets, such as China and uh, Brazil and, and others, uh, doing well, and Chile uh, doing well in terms of uh, <coughs> vaccination, doing well in terms of reporting, and other markets uh, just um, having providing very little little for their population. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is just a quick picture uh, showing recent trends. And we can see, and probably many of you have already uh, read about this or heard other speakers talking about this. Um, there has been a surge uh, in the number of cases uh, in some markets. The United States, uh, it's one that is being highlighted in that chart, which is that line going up at the uh, right end of the chart, um, even though uh, the number of cases going up, it's not being proportionally uh, followed by uh, similarly by the number of deaths. Uh, but uh, uh, as <clears throat> in some countries, there is a large portion of the population that does not desire to vaccinate, uh, <clears throat> there is a uh, an issue of that most of those people who have been contaminated uh, uh, recently are those that uh, were not vaccinated. Uh, so that's putting uh, some stress over the healthcare uh, system uh, in, in those countries as the variants of the virus uh, sometimes develop and, and are more successful uh, in terms of infecting people. So let's move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> how, how was the economic treatment in emerging markets and elsewhere? Well, first of all, fiscal expansion. That's the government spending more money. Uh, and then there's the issue if governments do have money, <laughs> more money to spend. 
in some markets, uh, some emerging markets, yes, but in many emerging markets, the answer is no. Uh, they have very little uh, slack resources uh, to spend. Uh, what kind of expenditures uh, do they uh, <clears throat> increase? Well, first of all, there were transfers. Um, you would have uh, uh, the government transferring money, income, to the poor people or unemployed people. Of course, the criteria uh, has varied uh, across different markets, but the idea is that the government would help those that were more in need. There were countries with um, very good uh, 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 emergency income programs. Uh, Brazil was one of them amongst emerging markets uh, last year. Um, but then these resources uh, are end. And of course, you can't not just prolong uh, uh, these programs forever. Then there's more expenditures. Uh, what kind of expenditures? Field hospitals, more uh, medicine for ICUs, the vaccine acquisition programs, uh, uh, and then expenditures in general with the healthcare system. Uh, and then ex also expenditures with uh, similar transfers to businesses to try to help businesses so they keep people employed. So there were several different schemes in different countries for to help that. But the, remember, there are countries that have very limited uh, resources uh, to really uh, implement this. And then there's tax breaks. Uh, tax breaks in particularly particularly for businesses so that uh, those businesses that were the most affected by the pandemic, for instance, the service industry. Uh, in emerging markets, <clears throat> services are crucial. You know, services, as I mentioned before, people who uh, work independently as a construction person or contractor, a barber, uh, 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 someone that does uh, cleaning uh, services, facility services, whatever. Uh, there's all kinds of different uh, uh, house employment, which is common in emerging markets, domestic employment, uh, all kinds of uh, services that were very seriously affected by the pandemic. Uh, so some of these businesses needed help, small restaurants, grocery stores, uh, and markets, and so on. So the go governments could extend tax breaks. So that's that's fiscal expansion. And then you have the monetary expansion. So more debt, issue more debt, borrow more, uh, print more money, and naturally it would have inflation. Uh, so every country uh, uh, probably did this one way or the other, okay? So uh, uh, that does not come for free. That's, that has a price to be paid. Um, so many people may think that emerging markets may depend from aid from uh, develop, developed market countries, but that's not true. Uh, for for many, and certainly not for the larger emerging markets. So let's move on. And the issue is, will emerging markets be able to pay for the treatment? And for how long? Uh, it's very expensive. And for many markets, their uh, ammunition to deal with the pandemic was quite limited, and they they already run out of resources to do that. And they start simply to print money uh, 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 as issuing debt might not be as easy because you may not have a buyer. Uh, so they start simply printing money so they will have inflation. And inflation is a tax on the poor above all. If you have inflation, you have inflation on basic staples, basic uh, food, uh, which is the largest uh, expense item for poor people, and then they poverty will increase, as is the case in many emerging markets. Poverty has increased, uh, as inflation has increased, as unemployment 
has increased because businesses, particularly in the services sector, have suffered a lot. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, there are a number of uh, weaknesses in emerging markets that should be considered. They're not exclusive of emerging markets, but uh, uh, they, they may be more severe, such as fragile initial conditions, um, you know, more poverty, more informality, poorer tax systems, poorer health care systems, all those things that I already mentioned, fragile taxation and fiscal conditions, uh, emerging markets may not have the ability to tax businesses and people properly. Uh, tax evasion may be high. Uh, so uh, recovering uh, revenues through taxation may not be as easy. Uh, <clears throat> so the fiscal conditions are far from ideal. Uh, they could have fragile monetary and currency situations. So they might have gone into the pandemic already with a lot of debt, with some inflation, uh, with a weak currency, so that things only got worse. Uh, they would certainly have a less productive workforce in many places, particularly regarding technology. Uh, while in some places there might have been an increase in productivity through the use of technology, particularly in developed countries, in developing countries, many people, they, they just don't know how to use a computer or software. They barely know how to use their, their mobile phones. Uh, so um, this increase in productivity may not be seen in most emerging markets. Uh, a rise or strengthening of populism, of course, if you have increasing poverty, more problems, populist leaders offering easy way outs may find uh, uh, political strength for their for let's say simple solutions for complicated problems uh, which may not work in the longer run uh, weaker institutions so the judiciary is not strong uh, the uh, democratic system may not be too strong uh, the protection investor protection may not be good uh, so taxation taxation system may not be efficient, and and then uh, they, some some markets may depend on transfers from other countries, from such as let's say El Salvador, is a country that has a lot of people that live outside El Salvador that transfer money to their relatives to that country. So, there are many countries, many emerging markets which are in that situation. Let's move to the next slide, please. So. Uh, Many emerging markets uh, uh, may actually suffer more than developed markets, particularly because of the worse initial conditions, uh, the greater difficulty to apply the treatment, and then more difficulty in dealing with the consequences of the uh, pandemic and of the treatment, such as inflation and unemployment. Uh, so that's why uh, I believe the recovery may be very painful uh, uh, in many markets and very difficult. Uh, the issue of inflation uh, will always, always affect the poorest people uh, in any market uh, because inflation, they have no, no protection against inflation. Uh, unemployment may also be a major challenge. Uh, if uh, many companies move on to a more technology-oriented type of solution, employing less people, uh, if many people who became unemployed do not have the proper qualifications uh, to go back into the job market, and there are less openings in the traditional manual labor types of positions, in these markets, things will become very difficult for many people in these markets. So uh, these are some of the issues that I think emerging markets may face. Of course, as I said, always saying they are heterogeneous. It would, will be more severe for some markets and less for others. But these, this is just a, a general list. Um, and they mark, emerging markets may have 
more difficulty to obtain uh, financing from developed markets as risk aversion uh, may increase regarding emerging markets in these uh, countries. So uh, let's go to a second poll and see how do you react. Um, uh, for a long time, Brazilian Treasury, uh, David, could you open the second poll, please? Thank you. Uh, Brazilian Treasury bonds still offer attractive yields relative to those of other sovereign securities. If you could, would you buy a Brazilian Treasury bond or invest in a fund that holds them? So let's see what happens and what you think. Thank you. So you can see that the answer to this question was almost the reverse of the first poll question. 70% of you have lived in emerging markets as an adult, but only 39% of you would buy a treasury bond uh, from a large emerging market, which has had no default in the last 40 years. Uh, uh, and pays an attractive yield. So you can see that uh, the risk aversion regarding uh, some emerging markets may be very high. So you wouldn't buy, even though your money earns zero if you are in a developed country, if you invest in uh, uh, treasury or, or low risk uh, debt securities. So your, your yield is going to be very low. Uh, uh, so uh, you can see that this is the way actually many investors may actually think. And I say, well, I would prefer staying safe uh, in the safer bonds of um, some European countries or the U.S. and so on. And, and I will avoid uh, bonds from um, the major emerging markets, even though their yields may be attractive. I want to uh, go into it. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, also, there's the issue of future black swans. There might be another pandemic. <laughs> uh, uh, there might be uh, the issue of increasing environmental con uh, disasters. The condition, environmental conditions may, events maybe get more severe. Uh, as we've been seeing with fires and flooding and so on. Uh, so uh, maybe emerging markets and probably most developed markets, uh, will they have the proper resources to deal with future black swans? Uh, or will they be caught with short of resources uh, the next time something big shows up? Uh, it's a big concern because if you think of uh, uh, what many countries did in terms of uh, spending resources and printing money and buying debt, uh, issuing debt, uh, buying private debt and so on, um, it's, naturally most countries are not the United States. They won't have uh, close to unlimited resources. They will not be able to do that. Uh, they, if, and if they try to do something like that, they will probably severely punish the poorest citizens uh, of the country. Um, so let's move on. Uh, this is just a quick uh, chart to show that even though these issues are there are present, you can see that uh, historically, and this is a chart uh, beginning in uh, 2017, 
you can see that emerging markets have done uh, well, um, but that's an index of the wealthier emerging markets. And naturally, China is a big part of that index. If you start looking at on a country by country basis, mm, the story might be very heterogeneous. Uh, the line uh, on the top uh, are, is the emerging market indice, index and the shaded blue line is the world index, which is dominated by the wealthier countries. And naturally, about half of it is the United States. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so uh, what I can say in my final remarks is that uh, naturally, obviously, emerging markets will always have good businesses for people to invest. But then uh, one would have to be uh, uh, an asset manager, which is quite informed about specific businesses in, in, in emerging markets to uh, take advantage of these opportunities that will always be there. Um, uh, but uh, emerging markets in general may not be a, a sa as a safe bet as, as, as maybe it was before the pandemic. There's the issue of the rise of populism uh, and that may also uh, prevent investors uh, to go there, at least uh, the more traditional investors, uh, simply because of weaker institutions, the weaker judiciary, uh, the rules might change in more unpredictable ways, and there might be more social and economic unrest. And also, more and more, there's the issue of... Uh, ESG, uh, you know, the governance, social and environmental issues, uh, which may be um, poorly handled in many emerging markets. Uh, so um, those that want to invest in emerging markets may actually face uh, greater risks, uh, more gr gr uh, risks which are greater than those just a couple of years ago than they work just a couple of years ago. Uh, and to close my remarks here, uh, just go to the next slide. Uh, a few thoughts. Uh, this is this is coming from the Bridgewater Hedge Fund people. So a few remarks uh, they made in a recent presentation. Uh, this this sum, uh, sums up. So the major risks are the fiscal expansion, central bank money printing and inflation, as I have mentioned uh, before. Uh, there's the issue to reduce home bias through geographic and economic environment diversification. Okay, uh, diversification both geographically and in across different industry sectors is it's a good thing, um, but uh, many asset managers do not consider the vast majority of emerging markets. They may consider a few like China, they always consider uh, and a few others, but they might not consider many emerging markets. Um, for instance, they may consider some markets like Russia or uh, Kazakhstan and so on when they consider the commodities industry, but not in general. Uh, when they are looking at technology companies or retail companies, uh, consumer discretionary companies, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so only a handful of emerging markets may be favored by investors in the near future. Um, so I would like uh, to jump, David, to the last slide uh, with the poll. Uh, let's jump this one. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll take one last question for you. Please open the third and last poll. So what may be safer in emerging markets, debt or equity securities or none?
Okay, thank you. So as you can see, 30% uh, of you said never, you never lived in an emerging market. Uh, and 21% of you, about 20% of you, would not consider emerging market securities, be they debt or equity securities. Uh, an interesting thing is I agree uh, with those that said, 50, those 56% that said equity may be safer. And I do think that this might be the case in many, in many markets uh, because governments may be in a more fragile position and debt securities, particularly treasury securities, may face difficulties, particularly uh, considering inflation and nominal interest rates going up and some countries may actually end up defaulting on their debt. Uh, equity, if uh, good companies are selected, equity may be safer in the longer run than debt for some emerging markets. Uh, I do think that this is uh, a, a true possibility, uh, even though with equity, with stocks, you face short-term volatility for sure. Uh, there is more. There might be more volatility than that. But then uh, I was asking about safer securities and not necessarily more volatile securities. So a security may be safer in the longer run, even though it's more volatile in the short run. Uh, so I do agree with the fifty-three percent now of you that said equity may be safer, particularly in the longer run. I'm not saying that the people that thought that that would be safer are necessarily wrong in all cases, they are not. Uh, uh, but uh, in many ways, I've been thinking that maybe emerging market equity investing for the longer run may be a better choice than debt investing. So with that, I conclude uh, my talk and I open for questions, and I know that uh, there might be a few questions there, and we have some time. Okay, hello all, I'm Marco Rodriguez from uh, Copiad Graduate School of Business. So I'm going to assist Professor Leal with uh, the questions that you post in the Q&A window. And uh, I would like to invite you all to post more questions to Professor Leal. I've, I've got a, a couple of questions right now. So uh, to start, uh, a question from Stefano Causi. Uh, what about raw materials and natural resources for which emerging markets are rich? Do you believe these raw materials will play a vital role to bring out uh, emerging markets from the bad situation that the pandemic throw at them? Um, the answer is probably yes, uh, even though uh, commodities uh, are also volatile. Uh, so many countries which do not a diversified uh, list of exporting raw materials and uh, commodities in general uh, if they depend on one or just a few, they have always uh, suffered from the volatility of the, the, on the prices of these commodities. Uh, countries which uh, have a more diversified list of uh, exporting commodities and raw materials may benefit. So in general, the answer is yes, uh, they, they will help emerging markets that have uh, uh, or are efficient in, in producing these raw materials or extracting them. Uh, but uh, that's not all. Uh, you have to think that uh, for many emerging markets, employment of the poor people is in the basic services industry, which was heavily affected. And they may not necessarily immediately benefit uh, from an increase in price of raw materials. So even though, of course, the alternative is if, if, if they obtain uh, uh, low uh, 
revenues from exporting these raw materials is naturally worse. Uh, so the answer has to be yes, but it's not the only answer. It's not the only solution. Okay. Uh, so another question from uh, Aditi Pandey. Uh, are the emerging markets paying more attention to sustainability and carbon neutrality? How would this impact their financial health, considering sustainable business in not an easily achieved target? Yeah, that's a, that's a very serious issue. Uh, uh, there, there are a few emerging markets which have been more careful regarding environmental issues. Uh, and there are others uh, which do not have the resources uh, and they need help. Uh, to uh, handle issues regarding uh, the environment, particularly uh, not at the cost of their development. Uh, so the, one of the main issues is that should we sacrifice uh, our development, in, in especially the issue of poverty, uh, to deal with uh, more ideal situations for our environment? And there might be a few other emerging markets which are actually more aggressive to, to uh, regarding the issue of environment protection. And they think that this is an intrusion on their internal businesses and they may uh, not accept very well or pretend that they accept uh, global resolutions regarding the environment, but do not really, as there is no real enforcement, uh, they, they try to get by with a poor record, uh, actual record uh, regarding the environment. I think the environmental issues uh, uh, are one of the main issues that they will face because there will be, it's a true pronged uh, issue. On the one side, there might be more and more pressure from developed countries on emerging markets regarding the environment. And there, there will also be more and more domestic pressure uh, from people living in those countries, from institutions and organizations in those countries regarding the preservation of the environment. Of the environment. Uh, on the, but on the other hand, there will be short-term pressing issues, particularly poverty and lack of resources that may uh, lead them or, or may even lead them not to want to have the proper uh, response to the preservation of the environment. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, topic. And, 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 and the answer or the reaction regarding the environment has been uh, very heterogeneous across markets. And it has not only been a question of the wealthier emerging markets dealing better with this issue than the poorer emerging markets. Actually, we have very good examples of environmental preservation among poorer emerging markets and very bad examples of environmental preservation amongst the wealthier emerging markets. So uh, there's politics, there is lack of resources, pressure, and so on. So uh, it, it's on the table. But still, uh, I don't think it, the 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 uh, the the answer emerging markets governments have uh, provided in general is adequate. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, another question from Anastasios Papaniogioto. Uh, a high, really interesting presentation. Thank you. Why do you think uh, DM investors are treating theoretically? attractive investments with risk aversion. Uh, could you repeat, please? I'm not sure I understood the idea. Uh, yeah. uh, why do you think DM investors are treating theoretically attractive investments with risk aversion? Well, I'm not sure it's theoretically. Uh, uh, I, not necessarily. Uh, many uh, developed market investors, they are institutional investors, they are subject to prudence rules, and they are uh, they're subject to regulations, they are subject to 
uh, boards that represent the beneficiaries like in pension funds, public pension funds, and so on. So uh, in many situations, uh, it's not only a risk return relationship type of thing, but they are tied up with other issues. For instance, the environment. Uh, if uh, a country is not providing in their eyes uh, an adequate uh, treatment of environmental issues, even though the risk return uh, the, or the risk aversion issue uh, uh, might not be a, a, pro a big problem for them, but they might not go into the country at all simply because of other issues such as the environment, such as social risk issues or politics or things like that. So uh, these are not investors, all of them, uh, that are simply free to invest in whatever they like, uh, considering solely, uh, say, uh, a return to risk type of ratio. They may even look at the return to risk ratio and think, yeah, it's kind of good, but uh, there are other issues which I, or other risks, let's say, that I can't measure very well that don't show in the return to risk uh, uh, analysis explicitly because of measurement issues. And, the, and then I have some rules here that I have to abide to, and it's better that I avoid this market so I don't have to explain myself too much to my uh, regulators or my uh, uh, or the people that supervise me, like my beneficiaries and so on. So you have a lot of these DM investors which are heavily regulated uh, and supervised, and they might just think, well, it's a lot of work to justify my investment in this market, and it will be small anyway because I'm not going to make the – my, my biggest investment in that market, so why bother? Uh, I, that would be my answer. Uh, if, if I may compliment, if you look at a family, for instance, a wealthy family in a family office, they do whatever they want. So they might look at just at the return to risk situation, say, what the heck, let's invest. You know, I'm, I don't care. I do whatever I want. But it's not true for the pension fund, an insurance company, or even a mutual fund. Okay. Okay, uh, just a question, just a second, please. So it should be a, a last question. I think our time is uh, about to. Sure, sure. So uh, could you comment on China government raids on tech giants? Go go China government? Raid, uh, uh, attack. Uh, attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. That has shaken markets a lot. Uh, but I really don't think uh, 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 that the Chinese government, I was listening to an investor commenting on that uh, recently, uh, uh, and he was the, the opinion of that, uh, that investment manager, and I thought it was quite reasonable. They say, well, you know, there's a lot of talk about this, but... Uh, do you really think that the Chinese government uh, is going to act in a way that's going to hurt um, uh, their companies and so on? So what they want is essentially uh, a political alignment uh, and reaffirm uh, the uh, one party power in their country, but uh, they are not really shooting at their best companies and trying to hurt them. So they think he was just thinking that this situation will probably be accommodated and life will go on. That was the opinion of that investor that certainly knows more about what's going on in China than I do. And I thought it was quite reasonable. Uh, so uh, you would have to think that China is, uh, is a country with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, uh, a single uh, party in power and and that may want to reaffirm its line of thought and it would like to, to those that are leading their key businesses to be aligned with that i i think that's that's the that's the main issue and probably there won't be a major change 
going forward. So there was some volatility in the short term, but I don't think uh, there will be a major transformation. Okay. So Marco, uh, I think we are getting close. Uh, so we already went beyond 45 minutes. So I think I'll close here. Uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, coming to this lecture and I thank you for the questions and for the people uh, organizing uh, this program, in particular, David was very helpful. So that's it. I close here. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor. It was great. And thank you uh, again from our side, uh, Ricardo, and also Marco for moderating the questions. That's the end of proceedings for today, wherever you are, morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, just like to encourage you to attend tomorrow, where we will once again continue our whistle-stop tour of the Earth, of the globe. We start in South Africa with Martin Butler. We move on to Brazil with a presentation about Vale. We then go to Japan uh, to hear the dean of, or the former dean of uh, Keio Business School. Uh, we come back to Italy for the iconic Ducati company. And we end here where I am in Britain, in the UK, with David Denyer talking about a practical guide or resilience reimagined, a practical guide for organizations. So I urge all of you, if you can, to look in upon us tomorrow. Uh, you can travel the world sitting in the comfort of your own home or your office, and we look forward to seeing you then. Today's presentations have been recorded. They will be up on our website by tomorrow morning. Uh, you just go to the um, uh, timeline, click on the event that you want to review, and you will see there is a video recording which you can view at your leisure. So once again, thank you all. Thank you to all our speakers today. Thank you for attending. Um, I hope you feel you've had a good day, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to sign off now, and um, that's it. Thanks. Bye-bye.